All right, I think we're all set now. Thank you for coming back. I always like it when, you know, pe people come the first night, it's great, but when people come back, it means a lot to me. So thank you. Uh, we are on our road trip. Yesterday we went through the Grand Canyon, and today we're going to stop through the St. Louis Arch, uh, which I found it's illegal for planes to fly underneath or, you know, through the arch. The FAA had to make special rules against that because people did it, and then people still did it after they made the rule. So I think there's like 16 pilots that have done it and have been prosecuted since they made that rule. Anyway, just shows, you know, uh, how useful laws are maybe. I don't know. Uh, so first, as we did last time, we're on a road trip, so the first thing we got to do is ask for directions, right? Find the direction. So please bow your head with me and pray to ask God's blessing tonight. Dear Father in heaven, thank you once again for gathering us together around your word. And we come to you this evening after a long day. We're probably tired, maybe a little restless, so we ask for the blessing of your rest to be upon us, that we may have our blessed rest in you. Please enlighten us by your Holy Spirit, that your word may nourish our lives and give us direction back to our Lord Jesus Christ and all the grace and love you show us through him. In his name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so at the beginning, we're going to check the map. We're going to get a kind of recalibration where we were yesterday, where we're at now, and where we're going to go. So remember, yesterday we talked about these four questions, questions that God asks his people in Scripture when the people need guidance or help. Uh, God, and Jesus too especially, will ask questions rather than just give an outright easy answer. And the question actually ends up helping the people a lot more than if they just had the answer spoken to them. So yesterday we talked about where are you, where are you? Tonight we're going to talk about what are you doing? This is always good for, I find myself stopping probably like 20, 30 times a day and just saying, wait, what am I doing? So this will be good for me at least. Next, uh, tomorrow, where are you going? And then from where do you come? So we talked about where are you? This is the first question that God asks his people in scripture. Adam and Eve, after they'd sinned, he comes to them and says, where are you? It shows our reaction to sin, our view of God in our sinfulness is fear, shame, anger. And God's response is much different than what we would expect. Right? He comes to us with care, with concern, saying, where are you? Uh, and then we, see, we saw um, God cursed Satan and the earth, but he did not curse Adam and Eve. Right? He gave them blessings for their protection, for their guidance going forward. And the biggest blessing of all was Genesis 3.15, the Redeemer, right? Jesus Christ. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about what are you doing? Now that we know where we are, we're going to look at what we're doing in our lives. And we're going to begin by looking at 1 Kings chapter 19. So if you have your Bible in front of you, 1 Kings, if you don't know where that is, it's right before 2 Kings. <laughs> so it, it's 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. It's in the Old Testament. It's one of the history books of the Old Testament. <laughs> First Kings 19. We sort of, of these history books, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, we maybe know bits and pieces of them pretty well, but the whole like overarching timeline of the, the kings in Israel and then the divided kingdom, uh, we're maybe a little fuzzy on. So we're just coming off of, in chapter 18, a pretty well-known account of Elijah going up against the prophets of Baal. Uh, it's pretty well known because the prophets of Baal built this big altar to Baal, their, their false god, and uh, Elijah was kind of making fun of them, prodding them on, saying like, oh, he can't hear you, you got to shout louder. So they shout louder, and he's like, maybe, maybe he's asleep, you got to you know, do more. So they start like cutting themselves open to get Baal's attention, and surprise, he doesn't pay attention. Uh, and then Elijah calls down fire, which consumes the altar and uh, and ends up killing the prophets of Baal, uh, and so that's a you know that's a 
I got to preach a sermon on that text to <laughs> really explain it well enough. Uh, but that's just what happened. So there is a, a, a war going on in Israel, a spiritual war between these false pagan gods, and worship of these false gods was, was terrible. They did terrible things, including temple prostitution, child sacrifice, that sort of thing. Um, so this is not a matter of like religious tolerance, right? Because this is active, destructive, harmful evil that is being done. And it's a war between this false worship that constantly plagued the Israelites uh, through pretty much all of their history. They were surrounded, by this time, they were surrounded by these other cultures with false religions, and they constantly wanted to go to the other cultures for their identity, rather than the one true God, as he had revealed himself to them. That's exactly what was going on at this point. And so Elijah, who's a called prophet of God, is on the other side of that war, right? Um, and he is the one with the true revelation of God's word. He's the true prophet of God. So in chapter 19, we see the fallout from this, this big, massive conflict, this big event. Uh, chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel are the king and queen at this time. And if you know the name Jezebel, uh, you, you, you know, that's synonymous with like wickedness and evil. If you know the name Ahab, I have a novel to recommend to you called Moby Dick, the greatest American novel ever written. <laughs> You thought you got away from it. Never. So these are two of the worst rulers in Israel, and that's saying a lot. There's, there's worse than them too, sadly. But Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. So Jezebel, in revenge for these prophets of a false god, Baal, uh, sends a messenger to find Elijah and tell him, you are going to die by this time tomorrow, just like you killed the, the, the prophets. And if you don't, if you're not dead by tomorrow, may the gods deal with me in the same way. May they kill me. Right? She's taking this oath. She's putting her own life on the line. Um, once again, surprise, those gods aren't listening to her, so they don't answer her. God has other plans for her later, uh, which that's a sermon for another time too. So Elijah gets a, a, a real death threat. The queen, you know, one of the most powerful. Actually, she was the most powerful because she had total control over Ahab. Uh, she, you know, practically ruled everything. Um, she says, you are going to die by tomorrow, this time tomorrow. We probably have not been in similar situations in our life. Um, I haven't, I don't think it's too common in our culture in America to receive a very realistic death threat from the person with the most power in the entire nation. Um, so it's a little hard to exactly put ourselves into Elijah's spot, but we could probably use our imagination to think about how we would react, how we would respond. Um, all of the resources of the military are at her disposal, and she's coming for you by tomorrow, right? Elijah, verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Yeah, I would too, I think. Um, <laughs> when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. So Elijah's at a point where he's had this legitimate death threat. He knows unless he flees, he's going to die. Not only that, he had this awesome display of power on top of Mount Carmel from God himself, making himself known in an extreme presence of power. And did it accomplish his mission of being a prophet? Did it save any souls? Did it proclaim the word of God? It did proclaim the word of God. It proclaimed the judgment of God. But did it save any souls? No. Probably not, right. What saves souls is the gospel, right? The comfort of God's grace. The harshness, the punishment of the law has never saved a single soul. So you can imagine, despite this Im immense display of power that God has put at Elijah's disposal, it came to nothing. 
The king and queen are still alive. Now they're gunning after you. You're in their sights. You have nowhere to run except out into the wilderness. So all of the work that you've been called to do by God has come to nothing, right? What's the fruit? What's the benefit? Nothing. I'm a marked man. I'm going to die. I've got to go away from everything I know out into the wilderness and try to survive out there. So that kind of helps us, give, it gives us a perspective on where Elijah's at right now. And when we read these verses, Elijah's response to this, where does Elijah go for help, for direction? The wilderness, the wilderness yeah. He runs away. Why does he go to the wilderness for help? He wants to die, yeah, and to, you know, not be seen by anybody, basically, to get away from everybody yeah. to save his own neck. And not only that, not only is he going out to the wilderness, but as you said, he wants to die. He's given up, right? He's reached that point where it's like, what good is it? All of this immense power, this, this holy word of God, and yet, what are you doing, God, right? Why, what's going to happen because of this, right? So he goes to the wilderness, and what does he find there in the wilderness? A desire for death. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestor. I've had enough, Lord. Whew. That's uh, probably my most common prayer, maybe, <laughs> I think that I pray, right? Oh, Lord, have mercy. I've had enough, right? Not, not take my life, Lord. I, you know, <laughs> I don't get, thankfully, by the grace of God, I don't get to that point, but just, okay, fine. You know, what, what is going on? What are we doing? I've had enough. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not. It's nothing. You know, in in my ministry here, that causes me that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I'm happily stuck here for as long as I. You know, I. Yeah. <laughs> no death threats against me. I haven't had any, so that's good. <laughs> You're not gonna send out hitmen. To... <laughs> Right, no, that's a good point, right? If he wanted to die, uh, that, there it is, right? It's waiting for him right there. So it, that's an interesting part of, I think, us human beings, the human heart, is we get to a point where we've had enough and yet we can go on, right? <laughs> we don't really want to have enough. Um, the, the thing is, though, Elijah goes out to the wilderness, and that leads him only to a desire for death. He's had enough. He has no idea what all of this has been worth. And so where does Elijah find help? We can continue in verse 5. Let's, let's reread verse 4. He, Elijah came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. So where does Elijah find help? Prayer. Prayer, yeah. Are you a lot more? No, well, it, only if you're willing to answer more. But I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. Uh, does Elijah find help in his prayer? Does God answer his prayer the way he asks for it? No. No. So he goes to prayer. He goes to God, but it's a prayer for death, right? For despair, for failure. So does Elijah find help? 
And the next verse is you'll probably tell us. Yeah. So he's lying down. He's as good as dead. He wants to die. Does he find help? The angel finds help, or the angel finds him, right? Help finds him. So even though Elijah does the right thing, praying to God when he needs help, and especially in circumstances like these, uh, is it a prayer in accordance with the will of God? No. No, because no, the will of God is not for him to die, right? Not for him to give up. It's for him to live, to be strengthened. So I think the, the specific point I'm trying to make is that Elijah does not find help. Elijah does not do what is necessary to get help. Elijah does not help himself. If he wanted to help himself, he would you know, dig a grave and lie down in it and wait for the you know, army to find him, right? It's God who helps him. Help finds Elijah in a completely unexpected way, right? Uh, an angel. It, it's funny, he didn't ask for an angel, right? <laughs> he didn't ask for God to defend him, to help him, to be there with him. And so while he prays, first he doesn't pray in accordance with the will of God, which we see from God's response. But second, you know, there's a lot of other things he could pray for too, probably better things. And I think that that is, when we pray to God in despair, in frustration, in irritation, when we lose all of our patience and we pray to God, you know, we should be careful what we pray about in that time, right? With God, all things are possible. That's our theme for tonight. But would we want all of our prayers to happen to us, right? When we pray them in a moment of extremity, like Elijah's in. I can see in my own life, looking back, there's plenty of prayers I made. I'm really happy they <laughs> didn't come to pass, that God didn't give me that, right? And in that moment, you can't see that necessarily. You can't see how God will work it all out. And I'm not saying that if you ask for an angel, that an angel will then like appear in front of you and you can see an angel and he'll bring you McDonald's or something, right? But the point is God does find us. We don't really find help. We don't help ourselves in that sense, right? And so what does the angel of the Lord say? Oh, and by the way, it's not just an angel. Uh, it's in verse 7, it says the angel of the Lord, which we, we usually take to mean this is Christ Jesus himself before his incarnation. So before he took on human flesh and blood, this is the second person of the Trinity, the angel of the Lord appearing directly to Elijah. So what does the angel of, of the Lord say to Elijah? What, what are the words he uses? Arise and eat. Yeah. Does he say, don't worry, Elijah, uh, God wouldn't give you more than you can handle? Get up and come on, pull yourself up. No, he doesn't. I mean, Elijah's dead, right? He's down there. He wants to die. He's as good as dead. Uh, and that's the shout out for my Red Dead Redemption fans out there. Yeah. Um, no, he, d he does not say, God would never get you more than you can handle. Pull yourself up, right? Dust yourself up. No, of course not, because he can't. He can't find help on his own. He says, arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. The journey that God had led him to, had put him in, is too much for him to handle. It's too great for him to be able to help himself. And that's something, I know I've spoken about this before, and I repeat because it keeps popping up. I see it keep popping up. I think a lot of people believe this, this, this false idea that God would never give you more than you can handle. Right? Have we all heard that before? God will never give you more than you can handle. The thing is, that is not in Scripture. That's not a promise God makes. The passage says, you, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability to bear, but will always provide a means for escape. That's very different than God not giving you anything more than you are able to handle. Uh, if God never gave us more than we can handle, we'd handle everything on our own, right? Elijah would be able to get up, dust himself off, go back to being a prophet, you know, be really super successful, uh, but he can't. And so... 
God gave Elijah purposefully a journey that was too great for him in order to feed him, right? And that's what he does. He brings the strength. He brings the nourishment. He provides Elijah with exactly what he needs. And notice it's not the end of the journey, right? It's not like everything is great and perfect and good. He has a long way to go yet, but God gives him enough to keep him going to a greater purpose, right? So what do we do if God gives us more than we can handle? Pray, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. 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 And thought too, you know, like you said, God did us everything. We got every time we went to the Lord and He gave us everything we asked for. I don't think our faith would be very strong because we no. don't get it. No. If you don't get it, you really you guys need the Lord more. Yeah, no, I think so. Even though it's not your answer, but it does help you. I just have more strength, I think, sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. If God was just, you know, a, a convenience store that we go to whenever we want something and he just, here you go, uh, that would not be faith, right? That would not be a relationship with God. That would be, a, we talked about it a bit with Job, you know, that would be a, an exchange. That would be, what can I give you? What can you give me? Right? That's not love. That's not a, a relationship with somebody. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we have to be like aware of the answers that he has given us. Mm-hmm. When we were going through everything with Josh and NICU, the day before I gave birth to him, I had a dream, and like I was so peaceful, and I knew like that he was going to be okay and preserved through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how we were going to get there, and it was a rough three, four months, but he saw us through that storm. Mm-hmm. They want to take away all the pain and suffering that's going along with it. Yeah. I had like a peace in my heart that like it will be okay. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what God wants, right? He doesn't want to take away all our earthly problems magically, you know. He's not waiting for us just to have a strong enough faith or just pray to him so he can be like, okay, you're good, boom. He wants to be there with us. I mean, his suffering and death in Jesus Christ proves that to us. He's the God who suffers with us, right? And that's exactly where he wants to be for us. That's where he nourishes us. That's that's the reason we, in the Lord's Supper, we eat the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in his suffering and death, right? We commune with the suffering of Jesus because he is communing with us in our suffering, right? There's another point I I had. Um, Oh, yes, pray, like, yeah, pray, absolutely. Pray continually is what scripture says. And in particular, that prayer uh, from scripture, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach me to pray for the right things, the things that are pleasing to you. Sanctify my prayers by your Holy Spirit, which he does, he promises to do. Um, I I like to use this example, forgive me for repeating myself, I know I do, I'm getting old, but uh, (laughs) you know, the purpose of, you know, they say uh, repetition is the mother of learning, right? So the more I repeat myself, the better I learn. So. We try to think of the words to pray, right? We try to come up with, I don't know how to pray because I don't know the right words. But scripture says the Holy Spirit takes all of our prayers and he translates them into unutterable groans. So the Holy Spirit's going to perfect that prayer by groaning anyway. So you may as well just present your whole heart to God, even without words, right? Make an offering of yourself, trusting that God is there hearing you. Um, Oh, and the other thing is, uh, one of the things I've been working on recently, it's really hard, I would recommend it, but I also want to warn you, it's very difficult, is to take all of the little frustrations you face throughout your day, the little irritations, the annoyances, and then even the big ones too, the big inconveniences, the big uh, trials, and immediately when they happen, say thank you to God for them. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> but they're there, you know, they're there with you for a reason. And that's, that's one of the ways we learn patience and gratefulness, too. And the next day, you've got to say thank you for the solution. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Or the next week or month or year, yeah. Because <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that's another thing about prayer is it doesn't follow our timeline, right? Yeah. But it follows a much better timeline. Uh, yeah, so these are good. Like, yeah, this is, I, I think that God does pretty frequently give us more than we can handle, than we are able to handle, because he wants to show us he's the one that handles it, 
right? Just like he did with Elijah. He put him in that specific situation. The journey is too much for you because here I am. I am feeding you. This is not about you, right? This is not your power. Your life is not in danger. Your life is in my hands, you know? I am the one who gives you strength uh, and nourishment. Um, Did I have the second part of that yet? Not yet, no, okay. Uh, The other thing is I want to turn to Luke chapter 8. This is our uh, lesson for tonight. Jesus raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead. Luke 8, and we have the verses down here, 40 through 56. All right, so Luke 8, 40 through 56. We have, um, it starts off with Jesus uh, uh, in in the midst of a crowd that's welcoming him, and then a man named Jairus comes to find him. He's one of the important people in the synagogue. He's called a ruler in the synagogue. Uh, And uh, he comes to Jesus, he falls down at his feet because his daughter, his only child, his only daughter is dying, is sick, and needs help, needs healing. Uh, 42 says, a daughter of about 12 years old. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. So Jesus says, okay, I'll go with you, Jairus. I will help your daughter. I will heal her. And then in the midst of this, the crowd is so much that it's pressing in around him. It's almost crushing him, right? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that. Um, I was at a Pearl Jam concert once, and it got kind of like, you know, way beyond. There, there's no personal bubble. I was in the... Uh, Korean subway, too, during rush hour, that is like, whoa, okay. You make a lot of friends, let me tell you. (laughs) And then verse 43, a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. And we hear in the other gospel accounts, she had spent all of her money on doctors, and none of them were able to heal her or figure out what was wrong. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And uh, imagine you're Jairus. Your 12-year-old daughter, your only daughter, is dying. Here's the man you believe, you know, can help and heal her. You're going along and there's all these people getting in the way, getting in the way of Jesus. And then there's a woman, or, you know, then he stopped. We, we don't know this yet, but then Jesus stops and says, who touched me? And you're like the disciples. You're like, are you kidding me? You're stopping for this? You want to know who touched you and, like, there's people all over? And that's what his disciples say. But then Jesus says, no, I, I could be here all day. I want to know who touched me. Imagine you're Jairus. It's like, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing, God? Come on. This is important. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, oh, that's a good word right there. Imagine you're Jairus and your daughter is sick and dying, not just sick, but dying. And then Jesus calls this woman daughter. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. This is just a roller coaster for Jairus if we put ourselves in his heart. Like then verse 49, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. You had that brief, like you had that frustration of like, why are we stopping? Come on, we got to go. Let's go. Come on, come on, come on. And then you had that brief moment of joy and hope and faith where it says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Yes, this is what I'm looking for. Let's go. And then your daughter's dead. Whew. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. 
When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. If there's anyone wailing at my funeral, um, I mean, I like Moby Dick, so wailing would be kind of cool at my funeral. But <laughs> don't, don't hire professional mourners, you know. <laughs> they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. They think he's joking around, right? But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Hey, there you go. There's that nourishment, right? That strength. You've been through an ordeal. You've been, Elijah was nearly dead, wanted to die. This girl was dead, actually dead. And Jesus is there, not only providing life and hope, but food, strength for the way, nourishment. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. That's interesting, too, when Jesus tells people, don't talk about these things. And then they do anyway, right? <laughs> I, might, I might do a sermon about that, like saying, okay, this week, don't tell anyone about Jesus, okay? Don't do it. I'm watching you. And then maybe that'll make people want to go tell more people about Jesus. And Jesus did that quite often. He did, in different situations, yeah, for, for different reasons. Yeah, it wasn't just here. Yep. He tells, he tells the demons to, to shut up when he drives them out because he doesn't want people hearing about Jesus from the mouth of demons, right? <laughs> he doesn't want people hearing about it from a, a, a source that could be mistrusted or misconstrued, right? Um, not saying that that's what Jairus and his wife would do, but he had his reasons. So Elijah's ministry didn't go as planned, right? It took a big detour. At the height of this display of power, suddenly he's at the height, the lowest part of his weakness, till he wants to die. Discouragement, fruitlessness, what's, what, is, what am I doing? What's my work, right? Death threats. Jesus' trip to help Jairus didn't go as planned. He's interrupted, which the kids are learning it, this lesson just about Jairus and his daughter. They cut out the whole middle section, which I, I don't like it when they do that. That's the way the readings in our, in, on Sunday church do it too. They cut out that middle part. That middle part is so important to the whole point of the, the story here, the narrative. Well, one, because uh, it's not a diversion it's part of what happens and Jesus calls her daughter like that's so important he need Jairus needs to see this um, anyway Jesus' trip didn't go as planned there's a detour they're stopped he had a detour find him right uh, both of these accounts they're about people getting much much more than they can they themselves can handle Elijah we talked about that Jairus the death of your daughter, I can only imagine, would be more than I could handle. The woman, 12 years, a medical problem, bleeding internally that she can't, she has no idea, her doctors can't solve, she spent all her money, she has no more money, no resources, on doctors that did nothing. That's a problem she can't handle for 12 years, right? And Jesus meets every single one of them, exactly where they are, and gives them exactly what they need, right? He heals the frustration that Elijah faces, the discouragement, the despair. He heals this woman of her sickness when not a single doctor could do it. He can do it in an instant, not even like focusing his attention on it and saying specifically, be healed. She just touches him and it, it happens, right? He doesn't even have to bat an eye. And then Jairus' daughter, he brings the healing. He brings the life. Where Jesus is, there must be life and forgiveness and salvation, right? And so that, that's sort of the point is God sometimes does give us more than we can handle to help us realize we can't handle everything, but he is there with us always. And where Jesus Christ is in his word, in our hearts through faith, there must be Forgiveness for all of our sins. There must be everlasting life and life to the full, even while we live in this veil of tears. It can't be any other way, right? And so it's Jesus is the one who handles all of these things. He is the one who does it, right? What are you doing? Jesus is the one who is doing it. 
It's all Jesus' work, and it, it, it comes to us always. It comes to us in the Word, and as we talk about over and over again, the Word and the sacraments, right? The means of grace. That is, those are the places God has said, here I am, always, for you, in my own everlasting life, from the empty tomb, in my own flesh and blood, I'm with you. Kevin, yes? You know Jesus knew who touched oh, no, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is an example of Jesus asking a question that he, he knows the answer to. Yes. Let's work through that, yeah. Why would Jesus ask the question, who touched me, when he knows full well and he could just point her out? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it kind of diminishes, diminishes it. It's like, hey, I just healed that woman over there. That sure. Really yeah, yeah, right. People are really, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it sort of makes it sound like a parlor trick more than anything else, right? Like, I'm reading your mind, and it's someone who's a plant in the audience, right? Like, <laughs> he makes her be the one that comes forward to acknowledge it. And then I had to be frightened, maybe. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is to put ourselves back in Jewish society at this time. A flow of blood for 12 years, she's perpetually unclean. She shouldn't be in that crowd because everyone in that crowd is unclean now. But like all things unclean, when they come in contact with Jesus, oh, the dead, bo the dead body of Jairus' daughter would be unclean, too. And Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and the parents would be unclean just by entering that room. But both of those show, here's the other connection, too, between the two accounts. Wherever Jesus is, there is purified, right? Nothing is unclean in the presence of Jesus. Uh, and so I think that's another point, too, is... is to show that um, uh, she, she was afraid because she didn't want to reveal this disease, uh, but once it was healed, she was purified, it was clean. Um, and I think the, the other part is she had great personal faith, right? Intimate one-on-one -on -one with God. Jesus is calling her to make it a public faith, right? Because Jairus needs it. Jairus needs it right now at this moment. And Jesus indicates that with his use of the word daughter. Your faith has healed you. Um, and so I, I think that is, is likely why Jesus asks the question and has her answer rather than just making it obvious and apparent. Yeah. And that also is a lesson for us too, right? No matter what uh, the intensity of our personal faith with God, our one-on-one -on -one relationship with him, we're all called to make it Public. It's not just our faith. It's the faith, the Christian faith. We're, may, we're, we're called to share it with one another because we never know who needs it. She had no idea Jairus needed to hear this, right? But he did, and he heard it. Uh, another way that God meets us <laughs> where we are. I don't know how often this happens to you. It happens to me all the time. I hear someone else's confession of faith in Jesus, and I am just like, oh, man, my day is made. I'm just like, yes. Oh, I love it, you know? I know that with Jesus, I'm never alone because he's with me always in, in you know, word and, and by faith. But just to have someone else with us, you know? That's why we gather like this tonight. That's why we gather in church, fellowship with each other. It can be so helpful for us, strengthening our faith, especially in those times where we feel alone and we need it. Uh, okay. The other thing is then, back in, um, this is what God reminds Elijah of. You don't have to turn to it, but back in 1 Kings 19, because after the angel of the Lord appears to Elijah and feeds him, nourishes him, restores him, he travels to that cave 40 days and 40 nights away, which, by the way, he's 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Does that remind you of anyone? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yep. <laughs> He goes into a cave, and then once again, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? That's the question, like, what are you doing? It's good that when we don't know what we're doing, God finds us and knows what we're doing, what he created us for. 
And then Elijah says, I, this is his you know, confession of, I, it's worthless, it's hopeless. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. It's hopeless. I may as well die. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. He's going to make his presence known. And then this is another really wonderful account. There's this powerful wind that goes through. It says it, it tore the mountains apart. It shattered the rocks before the Lord. But it was not the Lord. The Lord was not in that display of power. And then after this wind, there's an earthquake. And the Lord is not in the earthquake either. And then after the earthquake, there's this great fire. It's like, wow, what, you know, what next? The great wind that tears the mountains apart, an earthquake that shakes the ground to its core, then a great fire that burns away everything that's left over. But the Lord was not in the fire. And then after the fire came a gentle whisper. That's the Lord, right? The gentle whisper. And so maybe also that's a lesson too for us is when we do reach a point where we say, what am I doing? What is the point of it all? Where is God in all of this? Uh, maybe we shouldn't go to the thing that distracts us or immediately captures our attention. Maybe we shouldn't go immediately to that desire for some big, great miracle or great, powerful event, some life-changing plan. Maybe we just need to be a bit quieter. Um, you know, a bit more silent, because that's how God speaks to us. Still soft things. I mean, water, <laughs> bread and wine, these are simple things. We're gonna, I'm gonna, I hope I'm going to bring this up tomorrow, but we don't like silence. I don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew someone would do that. <laughs> I think sometimes we don't like silence not because we're afraid of solitude or isolation. We don't like silence because we're afraid of who we'll meet there. We've got to meet ourselves in silence, you know. And then God comes to us and meets us in reading his word. We're silent when we read his word. He speaks to us. We don't talk. We don't pray. He speaks to us. Receiving the sacraments, right? I don't see anyone talking when... <laughs> You know, they're, they're eating the host, the body of Christ and the Lord's Supper. I've, there's babies who cry during baptism, but... Uh, <laughs> That's only the, because the water's cold. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, the point is that we see an image of God coming to us to be with us and speak to us in a still, soft voice. And so that's a reminder for us to be still and wait upon the Lord. And that sometimes all of this noise, this distraction, this seeking after a sign is drowning out God and what he wants to say to us, where he wants to meet us, too. Um, okay, we can take a break. 15-minute break. Break time. Where's my slot? Can I say something first? Yes. All right. There's a sign over here. Anyone would like to go to the 